I, I have lately been reading as much as I can from the writings of Rav Cook and come to appreciate not just what a brilliant mind he was and what a great scholar he was, but really what a good person he was, a person who really sincerely loved humanity, lived all living humans, all living beings, and uh, was an extremely optimistic, which sounds seems so out of place in the world we live in and, and also in the world he lived in. Uh, and I'm not an expert by any means in his thought. And it has to be said that his thought, his, 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 his works on whatever you want to call a Jewish thought, philosophy, mysticism, are, are not easy to penetrate, but certainly not systematic. He uh, wrote in bursts of energy, in bursts of creativity, bursts of, of in flashes and insights in which all of the things that he had absorbed and read, not just read from books, but picked up from teachers and picked up from just life, uh, was sort of, you know, went through a deep reflective process and came out in these bursts, which he wrote down in his notebooks. He knew that these were not, let's say, orderly and systematic enough uh, to be made into a uh, book. And he eventually agreed to let his prized student, the Nazir, uh, Rabbi David Cohen, uh, edit them. Uh, the Nazir was himself a, had a, uh, both a strong yeshiva background in, in Eastern Europe, but also a very solid university education. He was on his way to completing a doctorate when he uh, left to uh, visit, to visit, eventually move to and, and be the uh, student and almost right-hand man of Rav Cook. And he did what you would call, I guess today, light editing. In other words, uh, his, the, the books that come out, the Orot and the sort are are still not the, uh, the type of systematic, orderly presentation that you get, for instance, in David Coins and the Nazir's own lectures, which have come out in, in, in this set of volumes. Uh, but anyway, now we have his, his, his note, there are of note, notebooks as well. And I would like to uh, talk in this visit, in this, in this video, uh, some point is some things that I caught my attention reading what he has to say in terms of what we would call the uh, uh, philosophy or history and philosophy of religion. Now, one basic fundamental feature of Rav Kook's uh, philosophy of religion is a thing I mentioned earlier, his optimism, his feeling that uh, humans have all been born, are born with a tendency, an innate uh, inclination towards belief. Interestingly, it's, it's, it's the, the sort of the same idea that uh, very conservative, even fundamentalist Islam has with what they call jibla, uh, which I won't go into here. But peace, people are basically born believers. And given that, they are all seeking God and all religions, even the, the basest uh, uh, pagan idol-worshipping kind, uh, have at their heart some sort of uh, sincere and correct search for God. And this is a thing that he presses in his uh, deliberations on the topic. So, for example, when talking about idol-worship, he has a few interesting points to make. One, that uh, idols of, are, of course, material gods. They're uh, gods that are made out of wood or silver or gold. And uh, the people who believe them also have ideas of the gods themselves being some sort of material being, some huge mega anthropos or some combination of a lion and other beasts. Uh, but he, has, he says a few things. First of all, that despite having this idea of God being a sort of material entity, they all tend to recognize a higher uh, abstract moral code, ethical code that lies above 
all of the uh, uh, terrestrial uh, worship and, and uh, rituals. So they have something of this, which he calls Elohe Elohim, the God of gods. And moreover, he says that it actually makes sense that for most people, particularly in, in ancient times, but also on our own, I guess, uh, that they have a, a conception of a material God because the things that people are turning to when worshiping God and praying God are material. Many people preach today still against this idea of this, this habit of people, you know, for prayer being basically uh, coming to God with a shopping list. I need food, I need home, I need a, a new automobile, want to change my telephone, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and of course, it's understandable, particularly in, in poor people or in people in, uh, in uh, primitive cultures or people in extreme duress uh, would be doing this. And so for material needs, it would make sense to appeal to a material God. Even more interesting is this notion that he has that there is a certain uh, moral advantage, ethical advantage, towards having these, you know, these idols, these statues or icons or whatever uh, in your house, uh, which of course was a, uh, a common, is still common today. If anyone has been to India, I was in India a few years ago where, you know, not just in people's homes, but even say in an internet cafe, which they had no choice to use because the, uh, the hotel's internet, surprise, surprise, didn't work. But there too, you have idols on the shelf. Uh, and the question, he says, these serve actually an ethical purpose because the people who actually believe that the, these idols, these statues or paintings or whatever are with the eyes peering at you, can actually see what you're doing, well, cause the people who have them in their homes to be careful not to do anything, you know, criminal or immoral in the home because they think that quite literally their God is watching from the shelf. And when I think about that, I'm wondering, what does he have in mind here? Is he thinking of like, you know, the biblical, uh, the type of idolatry that the Bible uh, uh, argues against and preaches against, the type of thing that, according to Jewish legend, Abraham's, Aram Avinu's father was in the business of selling idols. Uh, or is he thinking of the uh, Russian, the Russian peasants, the Russian commoners that he might have known in, in his early years who had these icons in their homes, you know, to, before which they would light candles and whatnot. Uh, probably both, I would say. But in any event, he sees here even some sort of ethical advantage towards having these idols in, in, the, in the home. Now, another interesting feature is his idea of the, uh, that, that, that the different religions, different forms of worship, not just forms of worship, but law codes, including what types of foods are, 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 are prohibited or what types of foods are encouraged, we're encouraged to consume, uh, the festivals, when they are held, and things of that sort, uh, depend a lot on uh, on the ethnos, on the ethnicity, not just in to, in, including, of course, genetics, which he would consider these are these are things that are passed on, uh, but also climate. This is the climatological theory that was rampant and dominant uh, in in the Middle Ages and well into modern times, and is a lot of a lot of uh, bad things that went came in its wake, but we won't uh, talk about here. But it also plays an important role in the theory that's presented by the philosopher of the Kuzari. Here is one clear source for 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 uh, uh, Rav, Rav Cook's uh, thought, Rav Cook's understanding of uh, the differences in religions among different peoples. Uh, certainly comes from the presentation of the philosopher at the very beginning of Rabbi Yehuda Levi's Kuzari. And as I've argued, and I think you even have some videos on this, in my opinion, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Levi's model for the philosopher 
was Abraham ibn Ezra, his mechutan, someone whom he knew well, and their children married each other, and they had some open and sharp and fundamental disagreements about religion, which Avram ibn Ezra records in several places of his writings. And the philosopher says basically when the king of the Kuzari says, I don't know, you know, how to worship God, what type of, I'm getting these dreams that my form of worship, not my beliefs, but my rituals, my form of worship is not acceptable. What should I do? The philosopher says, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Choose any religion that you know about. And if none of them, you know, suit you, make up your own. They basically are designed to fit people for their climate. You know, the harvest festivals will fall at different times. They, they may, at the, in certain climates, it's, it's, it's better not to eat certain foods and so on. So this forms a part of, of Yudha Levy's, uh, of, of Rav Cook's uh, idea of the differences between religions, but he takes it a lot further with a nationalistic aspect, which he presses very hard. And this comes into play in a number of ways. First of all, he says that even though he's speaking on the individual level, that the individual should, will have this a natural tendency to search for God and worship God, and this will find expression uh, very much in line with the uh, genetic makeup of his people, as well as the climate, ha climate conditions in which he lives, and the social and, and historical circumstances uh, of, his, of his community. It's not just the individual. The individual contributes to the spiritual standing and the spiritual strength of the community. So when you are performing, you are going through the, the, the rituals and performing the commandments of your religious group, you're not just doing something good for yourself, but you're contributing to the collective spiritual uplifting of the community. And a practical consequence of this is this famous uh, notion, at least it, I hope it'll make me famous now, against changing religion for any reason, including uh, a, a pagan sort of moving up the ladder to Judaism, to, to Christianity and Islam, or even converting to Judaism. Because he says quite openly, explicitly, that someone who changes their religion is a traitor. They are betraying their own people, by, by uh, their former people, by denying them their particular individual contribution as they go and join another person, uh, group. Now, of course, if the, if the person's urge is, is so burning and so powerful that they can't resist it, and particularly this leads them to want to join the Jewish people, he won't deny it, and they will eventually become assimilated and actually contribute to the spiritual level of the Jewish people. But this nationalist aspect is extremely, is extremely powerful in his thought. So these are just a few insights that I've drawn from looking at uh, Huda Levy, at, at Rav Kook's uh, various pronouncements on religion, particularly in his Lenev uh, Chayador and some other uh, uh, books, and drawing on a few uh, short essays published recently in, in the Israeli news, weekly newspaper Basheva by Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, famous for the Pnei Alacha. I, I learned a lot from them and enjoyed them. I don't agree with 100% of what he says, but you know, I never agree with anyone 100%, even with myself. But I hope that you enjoyed uh, these uh, few ins uh, insights that I uh, represented in this short video. And uh, maybe we'll follow up with some more. Thank you very much for your attention and all the best to you.